All right. Mary, do you think we should go ahead and get started? Or you got yeah. more people? No, nope. okay. uh, we can let people in as they arrive. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Kathy Truex, and we're very happy to be able to sponsor this author talk program for the History and Biography, Biography Group. And today, our speaker is Dr. Tom Zeiler, and Trudy Peterson is kind enough to do the introduction. And I'm delighted to uh, uh, introduce Tom, uh, whom I've known for quite a long time. Um, he's a diplomatic historian, PhD from the University of Massachusetts, uh, author or editor of 14 books, Tom and counting, <laughs> and including a new Coursera course on uh, the history of America through baseball. Have I got it quite you right? And uh, so if you are interested online, you can listen to Tom talk about the American history on of the history of America by baseball. Um, he has served as president of the Society for uh, American Historians of Foreign Relations. I got it right, <laughs> wrong. And he edited Diplomatic History, which is the big journal in the field for a long time, over a decade and spent more than a decade on the Historical Advisory Committee of the Department of State. All of which brings us to his new volume on capitalist peace, which is an amazing survey in less than 300 pages of 100 years of American foreign economic policy. An absolutely amazing amount of information packed into a relatively few number of pages. With that, over to you, Tom. Oh, well, thank you, Trudy. Wow, that's, I don't know, some people think it might be too long still, but um, I appreciate that. And it's so nice to be with all, all of you, too. Thanks for inviting me um, to talk. And I, I was hoping I would talk for a few minutes and, and, and maybe tell you um, how I got around to this project. Um, uh, very much aided by the pandemic. This was one of the positives, at least few positives of the pandemic for me. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about that too. Um, facing all these sources. Um, if you look at the bibliography, there's a lot of, there's, there's, a, there's a lot in there in footnotes or endnotes. So, um, and, um, and also looked at this book as sort of, I don't know, you know, I'm, everybody talks to me about retirement. Um, I'm getting older. Uh, and so maybe this is a, a book that sort of draws together a lot of my, my earlier uh, uh, writings and, and not baseball. Uh, by the way, you can, you can tune into that Coursera for free too. All you need is an account, unless you're enrolling in a certificate or a degree program. So um, even my mom did it, my 90 year old mother um you know watched tuned in she said and even she said i remember the brooklyn dodgers so so there um let me share the screen i it, it, let me let me share my screen i hope i can open this i might not be able to though let's see i'm not going to share that right now i'm going to try to first i need to open this i should have done this before uh, zoom i'm off zoom i'm not there Sorry about that. Let me open this and see if I can and it's, tell me if you then can see this. Let me let me do that now. All right. Hopefully that's going to show someone. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. You can see that. Okay. This is just uh, this gives you an idea of uh, obviously for for those of you who have read it um great um for those of you who have not gotten through it um fine too um when i i started this book well before donald trump was uh he was around but uh um well before he declared uh his candidacy not well before well 2014 2015 so he was coming on the scene um, but I had already planned out this big survey of, of free trade and internationalism. Um, he boosted it a lot. I, I uh, sent this manuscript. You can do that when you're more senior like me. I sent this manuscript to five presses and all five 
um, accepted it like that. And I, I don't know if that's a credit to me as much as as the topic was on trade and, and tariffs and and this sort of nationalist populism, um, the a trade war with China. And of course, some of you will recall also basically a trade war with our allies as well, unfortunately, um, uh, that, you know, turned out to be pretty uncomfortable, I think, for for a lot of our allies. Um, but, you know, raising tariffs against Canada, good friends like Canada or France or other nations was um, pretty, pretty, um, for some ridiculous, for some certainly a, a sign that 70 years of internationalism or at least our economic policy of, of openness and free trade um, was ending or certainly changing and certainly was in jeopardy. We hadn't seen this kind of protectionism and this kind of talk of tariff wars uh, since the 1930s, which is where my book essentially starts. Um, so uh, Trump certainly helped get, get it uh, published and and as 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 sold books, of course, that's died out a bit, although we can talk about that, too. Uh, uh, Joe Biden uh, has really not changed the the China, the China equation and tariff war uh, all that much. Um, uh, but if you want to look at, uh, I always kind of think of it as of a, as a circle. You know, if you had Donald Trump here and this protectionism from whatever he was or is nationalist, populist, ultra right wing conservatism, if you look at that from that angle. Right next to him, if you'll recall, was Bernie Sanders, who is you'd think would be the opposite, right? But they were pretty close on trade, on, on talking about trade. The difference being, as I mentioned in the book, the difference being is that Bernie Sanders was a believer in internationalism and engaging in foreign policy um, and not America first necessarily. But the fact that the left and the right were that close on trade has been a, a history uh, that goes back well before this book. And the, the fact that protectionism um, or raising tariffs or, or, or quotas or whatever they are against imports um, uh, and to privilege American uh, manufacturing or agriculture or labor, uh, that goes back to the founding of the country. Uh, those of you who you know, recall your, your history, this, what, what Franklin Roosevelt did in the 1930s uh, in bringing in the Reciprocal Trade Act that sort of put us on record of cautious freer trade, cautious trade liberalization or lowering those barriers uh, to commerce. Um, what he did was really bring to an end about 150 years of traditional American protectionism. So, you know, what I found in doing research in this book too is, and I, it, it surprised me a bit, shouldn't have, but as I looked at the history from the 1930s up to the present, protectionism never died. And I guess I should have, I knew that, but it wasn't something I thought I would emphasize a lot in this book. Um, that restrictions on trade, uh, this nationalism, this populism that Trump expressed um, had a grounding. Um, it, it has waxed and waned. We've had periods when certainly in the Cold War, and this book is mostly about the Cold War, um, the, the, the push was toward freer trade and, and internationalism and engagement with the world through trade, which is one of the main ways we do that. Um, but uh, there was always in the background, whether it was uh, a more extreme case of McCarthyism, Red Scare, kind of isolationism uh, rising up, um, a Democratic Party by the late 1960s, certainly into the 70s onward, a progressive wing that has now pushed for more protectionism, uh, even though, of course, it is internationalist, um, you know, or or Trump, too. So I was just going to show you this stuff. You, you've got we, we can come back to these things, too, if you have questions or certainly comments about this, too. Um, you know, if you recall uh, 20 something years ago, this battle in Seattle uh, really ag against the World Trade Organization. Remember those riots there and and Bill Clinton shows up at the end. He's sort of now chastised about his free trade globalization mantra, which was really defined his presidency. And that was defined the, pre the Uni United States foreign policy after the Cold War, at least in that unipolar moment, as we call it, of the 1990s. 
But to say that many of these groups are sort of an unholy alliance of the Sierra Club and the Teamsters and uh, uh, conservative constitutionalists and others sort of all ganged up to um, speak out against uh, freer trade and globalization. And really, it was the first time that it came on our radar, been around uh, this this opposition, really on our radar in Seattle onward, you've had that anti-globalization movement, which is very much uh, hinges on free trade um, or opposition to freer trade, or again, the the, the expansion of, of trade and, and commerce and finance um, by lowering barriers and trying to you know, um, um, integrate economies. So there's one, I'm, I'm, I'm going back in history because um, of course, I don't think anybody here will remember this, but even the Marshall Plan, uh, at the immediate post World War II era, which of course, you know, there's an argument how much the Americans saves Europe, how much Europeans save themselves through the European Recovery Act, whatever that was, what their main goal was in American foreign policy, and certainly for the Europeans, was European integration, where Trudy is um, sitting right now, um, and leads to that coal and steel community in the early 1950s, and then the creation in the late 1950s of this European common market or European economic community, which morphed by the 70s in the European community and is today the European Union with a common currency um, and more political and social integration too. But that also was predicated not just on free trade and internationalism, but on diplomacy. Trudy mentions, and I'm a diplomatic historian, a historian of American foreign relations since, you know, diplomatic history, we, we don't like using the term anymore since it's so outmoded, um, or we think. But U.S. foreign relations, um, that's what, talk about grounding this book, what I was most interested in, it was in, was in taking trade, and taking the economics sort of out of it in a way and injecting the diplomacy and politics behind trade policy it's really trade diplomacy it's really using trade as a tool and in this case you built this cold war consensus around freer trade you still had battles between labor and management certainly big corporations and you saw that in the battle in the anti-globalization um, protests in seattle and elsewhere um, and that's something we can talk about too, whether free trade is a good or a not or not. I tried not too much to engage in that because I really wanted to make the point, especially in the Trump era, as Trump kind of handed this to me, is that trade is much more than just a trade balance, um, a surplus or a deficit. It is about relations with countries uh, and other countries, and that's critical too. My, my last year too is sort of emphasize that point. Um, really, since 1941, I could go to the 30s here, and this is sort of from a course that so you see nationalist, realists, or revisionists, or progressives here. But if you look not, not at those, not at those words, but at the pictures here of a of a Roosevelt and the big three at the top, or George Kennan right next to them, pictured alone, or Kennedy and Khrushchev, and Kissinger and Mao, and Obama. There's Trump. Um, you know, you got H. W. Bush at the bottom, circling back to the bottom left, and Ronald Reagan. Except for Donald Trump, all of these leaders pushed for freer trade, not so they pushed for freer trade because a big country like the United States and a hegemon obviously benefited from that, no doubt. And there's an, a soft imperialism, however you want to call it, from the left. But they really embedded trade and economics, international economics, into their diplomacy, into their politics. It's not an earth-shaking, necessarily overly original thesis of mine that, that, that I'm, I'm interested in capitalist peace or capitalist security in the Cold War. Uh, and I got in trouble with both my Marxist friends and my conservative friends who, none of them like it, none of them like that. Um, but I think if we look closely, hopefully I've made this argument throughout this, that this was really about security, certainly in the Cold War, security for all of these leaders, all of these presidents, um, and more. Um, that, and and, and, the, and Europe, Western Europeans believe that. Um, perhaps the Soviet bloc even understood that too. Certainly Japan, East Asia, 
those nations understood that what was driving the United States was not only the profit motive, um, to, but that profit motive was driving it to fund our commitments overseas. Trudy is at NATO to help fund our NATO commitments, to help fund bases security uh, overseas to this very day. Uh, I think uh, Ash Carter, who I believe recently died, a former Secretary of Defense, uh, and I quote him uh, talking about this trade, this Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP that Trump vetoed or pulled withdrew from within a few days of God taking office. It might have been his first day. Um, but he looked at that as an economic aircraft carrier in the Pacific to shape our approach to the People's Republic of China. That was the dominant hegemon, and we don't have that now. Um, but it was as much a diplomatic tool of pushing for trade and trade integration uh, within among our allies as it was for our companies to make a lot of money. Uh, so there's a lot here I'm, I've handed you here. There's a, there's a lot of argument that can go back and forth. I'm sure some of you are uncomfortable to talk about free trade and capitalist peace. I had a colleague um, um, in Boulder who said, you know, Karl Marx would be spinning in his grave talking about capitalist peace. Because, of course, Marxists in the left view was that um, capitalism is a, a forges war. You know, it creates war. Um, and, and, and there's a there's validation of that in the history of that. But that's not how American leaders now in the 30s and certainly as World War II came upon us. And now the British receded and Amer the United States, which had always everybody knew for the last 50 years, at least in the 19th century, was the economic powerhouse. Now, late World War II, early Cold War, to become the political and diplomatic leader. That's why in the Trump administration, we talked about 70 years of internationalism being jeopardized by this guy in the White House and an American first agenda. Um, that was a real stepping stone to the exercise of American power now, though, though as a political or diplomatic leader. The British, we really followed behind the British when it came to leadership um, in the 19th, early 20th century, th really through World War I, even they say World War II was the British plan. It was just America's economy and Soviet lives, um, um, that, that one World War II, but it was a British plan. Now the British are telling us, and you, you know this, uh, from your history, too, of of uh, the British pulling out of Palestine or, or weaker in Iran or Turkey, Greece and the Truman Doctrine was a real stepping off point for the United States. And alongside that, or again, I want to use this term embedded in there, critical to that was this agenda for free trade. And the world, or at least our allies, wondered if the United States really was gonna step up like that. We, they probably knew that we could exercise our military power, but what was gonna be the long-term thrust of American power? Were we gonna go back into being isolationists? Were we gonna care about our own economy because it's so massive and integrated in itself? Um, and this free trade system that we created along with an Anglo-American free trade system along with the British and then the other countries joined in, um, was remarkable. It was based on this Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act from 1934 that essentially has been renewed. It's, ba it's our basic trade law. It has been modified a lot. Kennedy had modified it a lot in 1962 in the Trade Expansion Act, um, the Trade Reform Act, and the Nixon years, um, Reagan did some of it too. So it's, it's you know, uh, it's, it's not obviously the same anymore, but that's the basic trade law. What that Reciprocal Trade Act did was put us on record for liberalizing or lowering or freeing up trade or lowering trade barriers, bringing them down. We had not been on record before that. There had been moments, as I mentioned in that 150 years before that, that we had turned toward lowering tariffs. It was a, it was a Democratic versus Republican battle. And you might recall that until, oh God, I'm, 
my dates on the progressive year 1916 or whenever the income tax, federal income tax came in, this country made its money, generated revenue through the tariff. Okay, and that's why it was protective. It had, that's a, when we turned to federal income tax and the creation of the Federal Reserve, everything else, now things have changed over the last 100 years. Uh, so that has changed. Um, the Reciprocal Trade Act was always, a, our trade policy has always been cautious, regardless of what people criticize us as, all oh, we care about is free trade, we're just predatory. We might be like that exporting, but importing, we've always had barriers. We've always been a bit hypocritical, but we've couched that in terms of saying there are certain industries or certain issues such as national security. Trump tried to draw on that, not very convincingly, but national security issues or uh, again, in certain industries and in lumber or fishing or shoes or whatever it is um, that we need to protect the market. Um, and that reflected political reality in the constitution, as you know, Congress contra controls commerce, right? The Reciprocal Trade Act allowed the President of the United States, the White House now to take control as the foreign policy executive um, to engineer our trade policy. Had to get trade bills passed through Congress, but once they were passed, once they are passed, now the President, the White House, the national security team, the State Department can go and negotiate trade agreements. Right. I say cautious, too, because when the British adopted free trade or freer trade like we did, they did so pretty wholesale. Uh, you know, they they pretty much created free trade. Um, there always been some protectionism in the dominions and Canada, especially and elsewhere, uh, Australia. Uh, but it was pretty out, pretty clearly uh, very lower barriers. The United States didn't really do that uh, until things really took off in the 1960s. Uh, but still, there have been long protect, uh, protections for political reasons, and uh, free trade doesn't pl always play well in Peoria. Actually, it might play well in Peoria because those are farmers who want to export, but not as well oftentimes in earlier on in Massachusetts and the textile industry, and then in the South when the textile industry moved there and things like that. So um, that Reciprocal Trade Act also, by the way, um, as you, if you, you know, noticed from the book, created the opportunity for the United States to now use trade as a diplomatic tool to shape a new post-war system that would prevent a third world war, that would eventually, as, as time went on, a few years went on in the late 40s and 50s, and help us engage our allies to create a solid capitalist bloc in the Cold War against the Soviet bloc. Um, and then carry through our diplomacy. And that was created in a trade system called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, which in the mid 1990s, after about a 50 year run or so, morphed into the World Trade Organization, which we have today, or the WTO. The WTO was sort of an idea that had taken shape in the late 40s uh, under an international trade organization that sort of was trying to govern all of trade relations, labor, employment. It was too much for America and we called it socialism. 50 years later, we were we were able to create that World Trade Organization, though there's still the, the arguments over how much control there should be by government over trade. The key was is that the GATT, as it was called, that General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, which lasted from 1947 to 1995, was fairly effective in lowering barriers. There were rounds or rounds of negotiations periodically um, and trade and, and they kind of hinged on American renewal of the trade legislation, the Reciprocal Trade Act. When we would renew it, then there'd be another GATT round to lower barriers. And so by the 1960s, remarkably, tariffs themselves had almost disappeared, at least as a factor. What, what Trump did with raising tariffs was a throwback to 60 years ago, 90 years ago, 100 years ago, and use tariffs, non-tariff barriers, quotas and buy America, buy American plans and other ways of protecting the market had gotten bigger. Uh, but the tariff that had been really the, the problem of the Great Depression, the trade war in the Great Depression, um, as nations kind of closed down and it shut down two thirds of world trade as everybody raised barriers to trade. That sort of disappeared by the 60s. It was a real success. 
I don't believe, my argument in this book, I don't believe that would have happened necessarily without the Cold War. In other words, without trade being used or embedded as a diplomatic tool. And so the Eisenhower kind of says everything I want him to say, Truman to an extent too, uh, but Eisenhower says everything I want to say that this is about the free world. Free trade is about the free world. Um, and so we need to low, make it easier for all of us to trade within our alliance um, to conduct and prosecute the Cold War and defend ourselves against the Soviet, eventually the Chinese. Um, it's the same logic we had with the, this Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership that you're looking at now um, with the new rival of China. And Trump dashed that thinking that trade really was about this large deficit <laughs> that we were running with the Chinese. That deficit after four years of the Trump administration grew even larger and solve anything. The rhetoric though is out there. You'll hear that, you hear that already in the campaign. Um, we hear that all the time. We've gotten very tough on China, the whole policy of engagement of the last 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, we've kind of put that aside now. So whether there'll be a trade war that turns into a shooting war, who knows? Um, but it will be, a, it's interesting that it's a trade war that has preceded any talk of um, a military conflict uh, with the Chinese as well. So that is essentially the book. W one more thing, because I know there's a, there's a question in the chat. And Trudy, I don't know how long you want me to blab on here. Um, but if there are questions or I can make more comments. I mentioned the sources too. I mentioned this was a pandemic book. Um, it was um, because I couldn't really watch reruns of Tiger King during the pandemic. Uh, I, in fact, once was way too many times. Um, and we were quarantined. I had, I had done research for this book really early 2015 uh, around the country, if not, you know, I'd been in, in Britain as well too. I did that a bit later, um, but around the country um, in congressional archives, the Hagley Library uh, down the road or up the road from you at um, um, the old DuPont um, uh, you know, mansion, it's a business archives, most, almost every presidential library that was open. And then the pandemic hit. I was faced though, I can show you my basement, which would make me weep and cry a lot because I, I did the old way. I, 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 I'm, I might've taken photos of documents. Um, so I didn't have to photocopy there, but I copied everything off, printed all these documents off. And I probably had I counted at one time, estimated about 15,000 documents for this book. And they were stacked by presidential administrations in my basement around my desk, very high. Some of these were very high. Uh, and it was disheartening. And then the pandemic hit. What else was I gonna do? I couldn't go run 20 miles a day. I run, but I couldn't do that. And so I sat down there and wrote this book from that, I was very lucky is that I had done the research already and I had all the books and everything here. So I was very fortunate. Some of my colleagues weren't that lucky because they were still doing primary research. So I was able to write this and really probably sped it. I don't know if this book would be out to this day. Um, and it also uh, came out, you know, came out in, in last fall. So the Trump era had, had, had died down. So I wish it had come out, you know, two, two or three years before. Um, I don't know how much we care much about trade and tariffs uh, anymore. Um, I think they will be a factor and I think we'll continue to have these debates too. Um, but that's sort of the genesis of that, uh, of all those sources too, that you see in the back of the book. Um, one more thing too, will we have these debates? We'll always have debates about trade policy. And I know my palms get sweaty when we start talking about economics. I know people say, oh, I don't know anything about economics. I get my students, oh, I, don't, I can't do that. Uh, I teach, I, I chair the international affairs program. I do a whole section on trade, investment, finance, and all the kids just, you can see them panicking. Uh, their humanities or social sciences, some don't, but most do. Um, again, that wasn't my concern. Um, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on how trade works in the processes. I'm not uh, on finance either and interest rates and exchange rates and everything else. I have an understanding of that. It is really stepping up that level as where does the Henry Kissinger start talking about trade? Henry Kissinger always called this low politics, but he didn't care about reciprocal trade programs and imports and deficits and everything else. He cared about is how do I use this as a realist? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I use Kissinger because it's 100th birthday last year, last week. So 
Um, I don't know if he still thinks about trade, but how do I use this? And he served in an administration, the Nixon administration, that really, for the first time, really raised tariffs against our allies. Uh, uh, that was the last time until Trump that that happened in 1971. It was there to try to force through a complete overhaul of the financial system. So once again, there was trade and tariffs being used as a weapon. We have trading with the enemy. We had, though you will remember, since I do, um, I was told in the 1980s going to school that you learn Japanese because the Japanese were killing us. That was our trade rivals, right? So that registered among average Americans, um, not because of yen dollar exchanges, but because it would became a political uh, fight, a diplomatic fight with the Japanese, uh, survival, an existential survival for many industries we're competing against, and the fact that Detroit, our auto industry, is now about 40% dominated by Japanese cars. Well, fast forward to 2016, even before Great Recession, but fa that hollowing out we call of the Midwest, because in part of trade, I think trade gets blamed for too much, but because of that assault by the Japanese who took, the, who took a large part of the American car industry, not to mention all the associated industries of rubber and glass and steel around that, there's where you've got the hollowing out, fast forward to the Midwest, and there's where you've got uh, this notion, right, that, um, you know, uh, uh, you've got to have a, a hope, hope in your economy and labor markets. If not, people will turn to demagogues. They'll, they'll turn to sometimes they're ridiculous demagogues. Uh, sometimes they're dangerous demagogues like an Adolf Hitler. Sometimes they're ridiculous demagogues like a Donald Trump. But they'll turn. They, they, they were, there will be an appeal there. It has reshaped the Republican Party. And because of that reshaping of the economy and the devastation in that economy, in part because of trade, but part because American leaders said, we will sacrifice our auto industry so the Japanese can prosper as strong allies in the Pacific. That's the bigger goal is to win the Cold War. And they were probably right about that. But that sacrificed American uh, labor. That is why that spilled over now into this racism, cultural, you know, this, this, this intolerance we have. Uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Georgia has turned a bit, right? Let's look to the Midwest as the new South now, or at least it's the old South. I mean, so it really, if you look at all of this link together, of what has happened in Pennsylvania and Ohio, Wisconsin, in Minnesota, um, uh, has, has been because of the economy. So sweaty palms or not, that economy is also hinged on, on trade um, as well. Uh, so I think that it's an important point to make. We need to be very careful. I, I remain a free trader um, because of the diplomacy behind it. I certainly damn well know that there has been globalization has not been a benefit to everybody and that we've had this growing gap. Absolutely. Uh, and I know that globalization has led to more skewing of economies and power abroad uh, as well. But for me, I'm going to admit to you, I'm going to give you my affiliation as a Democratic Party member. The answer is not protectionism because that's a slope that's easy to go down and benefits ultimately nobody the answer one answer would be raising taxes and 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 it's domestic policy domestic tax policy or revenue policy um trade itself is is blamed for everything it's an easy scapegoat and it's easy for americans to blame foreigners for their trouble too um but i think that's the wrong course to do so that's what i ultimately tried to make a case for in this book, um, a kind of a plea more modern of, of how we should move forward. That's a tough sell. Um, I'll leave it at that, except that there's the other plea of the war and diplomacy. You know, Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, longest serving, used it in the Roosevelt administration, goes back, I quoted at the very beginning of the book, goes back to um, a French philosopher, Bastiat, and others have used it. You know, if goods, if trade 
doesn't cross border, if goods don't cross, cross border, soldiers will. If you deplete, if, you, if, we, if we shut down trade networks, not necessarily for the United States, but for other countries who depend on trade, they will turn to demagogues, they will militarize, they will get desperate. The Japanese did it, um, countries in Europe did it, and it happens repeatedly too. Um, and it's a dangerous slide down. They'll send soldiers across the borders. War happens, in my view, for two main reasons. And, and capitalist peace perhaps can protect against both, but m one more than the other. War will happen because either I don't like you, all right, so there's a cultural side to that, or you have what I want or I need. Um, nations saying that. Um, and that second one is what trade, freer trade, hopefully will ameliorate. That's a lot of blabbing for me, and I apologize uh, for that. I can even go back. I can take. I can stop sharing here. Let's see. Uh, we got a question in the, in the chat already, okay. Tom. Okay, I'm going to look um, at that. Uh, and while you look at that, um, I want to ask a question, if you'll let me. Um, one of the the book is full of these quotes that are that just stick out. One of my favorite ones was from uh, somebody at WTO who said, history teaches us that trade does not guarantee peace. However, it does give peace a better chance. And that brings up for me the whole trade and aid conundrum. Mm. Uh, and you don't talk very much in the book about say the World Bank. You talk a little bit about IMF, but you don't talk about the bank. And yet, you do say that as early as 1954, there was more, if I've got the quote right, there we spent more on the aid than we did on the military in the year 54, which must be the only time in history. <laughs> but, but, you know, how does the aid against trade conundrum play out? And, and and it's very perceptive view. One reason I don't do as much with aid as I probably should have is, is space. But the other was um, from, as, as you note, Trudy, from the 50s onward, um, one of the main thrusts, certainly from Eisenhower on, is a trade, not aid policy is that we had aided, the Marshall Plan had been $18 billion, it was a lot of money back then. And there was a debate in Congress and in among experts and others, are we just gonna continue just to send money um, overseas? Now, the United States by the late 40s and 50s was more inclined to do that. We were okay with that and certainly mutual security and military. Um, but there was a big, une a real uneasiness and you see it today. How much are we going to spend? How much are ta American taxpayers going to send on aid? And does aid really work anyway? So the answer to that was, let's make sure we can trade more. Let's make sure that our aid results in the building of production facilities overseas of within nations that will now compete with the United States. Again, I quote, I'll go back to Kissinger, who said, you know, this European community that's now starting to compete with us in the 70s, 80s, maybe it wasn't such a great idea. And we've always had those qualms. But that was the answer to, to sending so much money overseas. I, I just, uh, there is a lot more being written now about aid. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think there is a real push among scholars, at least, to say, we need more aid, we need smarter aid, we need more creative ways to do this too. But the trade, the free trade system isn't working, isn't trickling down. Um, and we need more direct aid. And that's what, you know, that's a response to the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a, it's a response to the Chinese, right, who are aiding. Um, there's always strings attached to that. So what you've hit on is, a, again, a 70, 80 year old uh, uh, debate um, over aid. Uh, I wish I did that. That would be another book. And I think uh, um, it needs to be written. But thanks for pointing that out. There is that is uh, hopefully that answered you too, Trudy, um, a, a bit. Sure. Uh, let's go to the, the question in the chat. 
what power does the WTO you know, have to enforce policies? Uh, and Don, that's a, a, another, uh, you know, a great question and very perceptive because that's been the, uh, that there's been a, there's been two ways on that. One is there have been WTO supporters who have said it should have more enforcement policies. And we saw this in the Trump administration, but even before and certainly after, it might have too much authority. Uh, these are unelected bureaucrats, as you heard, um, who who don't who who don't answer to the electorates, but make policy as experts. Um, so there has been that judicial, the ju sort of the judicial arm uh, of enforcement of WTO that has been, well, it's been held up a bit, gutted a bit too. Certainly Trump administration, I, I believe it was Trump didn't name uh, an official uh, to that governing board uh, that would enforce things. So it's, it's back and forth. I, I don't know how, I'm not giving you a clear answer on that because I think people are still sorting out the WTO. There's, there is a, um, an organization, an agency that is not, that, that is really political fodder. Um, and, 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 and I think they knew that when they created it, went back to that international trade organization that was aborted by 1950, but had been sort of coming out hand in hand with the GATT was going to be the real key of governing and making trade fair and that we push that aside. So enforcement is a is a huge issue on this. It's not WTO uh, can't really thumb our nose at it, but you can you know, it's sort of like the world court too. I believe when you know Reagan thumbed his nose at the world court, for example, under Nicaragua. Um, there's there's a dispute mechanism that oftentimes is more powerful than the enforcement mechanism. And if, yeah, Dorothy. Um, uh, I have a, a two comments. Um, I was in the uh, Clinton administration on the economic team for eight years. So I have a lot of scars on my back from <laughs> uh, fights. Uh, Boeing, I was particularly involved in Boeing Airbus uh, aerospace uh, trade disputes. Um, but also scars from labor, labor pushback on, on what we were trying to do. And um, I think, you know, as, as a country, we have not, I mean, free trade is, is great for consumers. It has benefited American consumers tremendously. It has hurt American workers in certain respects, in certain places, in certain sectors. And we have never, as a country, come up with a way to um, to deal with that um, discrepancy. Um, we tried, you know, we we pushed trade adjustment assistance and labor unions viewed that as burial insurance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need something much, much more fundamental that takes care of workers that are displaced by trade um, agreements that benefit consumers tremendously. And I don't know if any country has figured out how to do that. Um, that's so that's one one comment. Um, another is that while yes, I agree trade is a tremendous tool of diplomacy and the State Department's budget relative, I spent three years in the Pentagon and the State Department's budget relative to DOD should be should be mm -hmm. a lot bigger. But it's also true that um, uh, di diplomacy promotes trade. And I, I remember meeting with the head of Marine Forces in the Pacific at, uh, uh, at a military base in Hawaii and he, him saying, you know, we, our presence in the Pacific is what al allows the, Asia is the center of the world economy. Those countries would be fighting among themselves if we weren't keeping the peace there. So our presence there allows for uh, for much more trade than would otherwise happen. And I worry that 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 um, very positive force is is diminishing, not that we're not still there, but that uh, the animosity among Asian countries is overcoming what what we can do. Dorothy, thanks. Let me take that. And thanks for both of those. And, and um, let me take that last one first. Exactly. I think that's what uh, 
I don't want to just call them free trade advocates because it makes it look like it's just going to be free marketeers and everything. But I think the Clinton administration was the one that really weighed these. Clinton, Clinton came as close to the Kennedy administration as well, 30 years before. He had a kind of mainstream Democrats who, who understood their labor, the labor side of things, understood the diplomatic side of things. Um, but I think, yes, there is a fear that uh, either China will run rampant and over, you know, overrun some of these countries um, or that they'll fight, they'll fight. And, and the United States has been the arbiter, has been sort of the umpire and sort of the umbrella, as you know, in the Pacific, maybe to an extent in Western Europe, though that's probably less so now, um, but in other parts of the world. And we do that through free trade um, or freer trade or, or a liberal trade. And that takes sacrifice, it takes sacrifice on our part. And it certainly makes it hard when you have political campaigns to run because, you know, everybody's America first. Yeah. Um, if, if you go back, Ronald Reagan's 1980 campaign was America first. If you go back, look at the campaign slogans. Uh, so everybody believes that. Um, what what Trump did was he sort of wep, as we called now, weaponized that and made that and used trade as uh, and he went after Hillary Clinton. So did Bernie Sanders went after Hillary Clinton because she had supported the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. So um, that's at home. Uh, freer trade sort of keeps a peace, capitalist peace, and overseas too, as you alluded to as well. Your 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 first comment about trade um, adjustment assistance is also really interesting, and I think right on point. That's that's Kennedy. Kennedy came in with that first. It has never been enough money. It's why I also mentioned a few minutes ago that. Um, what really needs to happen is either you beef up trade adjustment assistance in multi billions and really make it meaningful or you raise taxes or some other way to raise revenue and come up with some other system because people are suffering um, and and it's easy to blame trade i think there have been trade agreements that have hurt us and we're seeing that in the gap in inequality in the middle class and and others we didn't have that in the 50s and 60s really labor sensed it by the late 60s i mean you know, the american labor movement was the free trade advocate you know uh, in our history up until 1970 or so um and was was so because american manufacturing were the protectionists and labor was always at war with manufacturing so that that um support has to come back for free of trade. You know, and you know, the Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton took such heat for NAFTA, another related to, and, and WTO. And it was really the Republicans that put both of those over the top for him. It was Newt Gingrich yeah. who put them over and it was frustrating. Um, so I have to say my Democratic friends, we talk, they, they, they look at this book and say, wow, yeah, boy, 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 you're just like a free marketeer conservative. I said, no, it wasn't like that. You, you you didn't have that. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have said that fifty or sixty years ago. Too countries change, um, but I I do think Bill Clinton, your your administration really wrestled with this. They really wrestled with this post Cold War. In a way, the Cold War made the rationale for free trade a consensus that both parties could basically agree with. When that was over with, globalization seemed so exciting. Remember those days when the internet was mm -hmm. going to link us all together and everything? We've now changed. And China then was weak, relatively weak. Um, in the last 20 years, things have changed. And, you know, there's another thing, too. Um, one more thing here is the Great Recession. I don't, I, it, it's gone. It's not gone from memory. But that was the second Great Depression, really. I mean, I don't think I'm exaggerating that and how devastating that was and how that changed politics. A, a Donald Trump could go to the Midwest and say, you know, yeah, you, you voted for Barack Obama in 2012, and I think Americans gave Obama another chance, right? Okay. And he did his best and tried the American Recovery Act, but it still wasn't working. It still wasn't working. It's, the country is still there's still hollowed out areas that had been traditional democratic strongholds, as we know. Um, so I think that that second Great Depression will be with us for a while. You know, the Bush two administration didn't help matters with billions of dollars spent. We can go on and on about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but that also handed it handed a Trump 
an argument to say, along with war making and sending our boys or girls into battle, free trade, the same, that's all elites. Those are all elites who have made this policy and have ruined the working class and the average American. I think we got to be careful, though, about who Trump appeals to. It really isn't working class. It's really lower and middle middle class um, and small business, too, who have been resentful of what's Tom, happened to you. Tom, you got another question in the chat. All I'm right. watching time and. All right. Let me say that's from Sonia. Is it the income debt decline or the loss of status has created the resentment, by the way, I know someone who did well with retraining? Um, good question. Your question, Sonia. Um, I think they, I, I guess they go hand in hand. You hear all these stories about even uh, people, people, a white middle class in the 50s that didn't worry so much. They were unionized. Um, unions, that's another thing. I think the story is also unions really busted from the late 60s or 70s onward. Um, that led to declining incomes uh, among a working class or a middle, lower middle class or less opportunities. Or now what we have of people working two or three different jobs and retail doesn't pay all that at much. We hopefully have minimum wages, but I think the status is there too. Well, I, th I, I think that's what a Donald Trump really, I think it's a great, very, a, a great comment you're making. I think that's what uh, he can play on. Uh, I, I have the sneaking suspicions Donald Trump doesn't really care that much about those peoples and their economic, how they fare economically. That's just my, I'll inject my political view in there. I don't think he really cares about that. I don't think he cares about anybody but himself. Um, but it's the status, how we can use that. Uh, you know, look how things were before and now look where you are. Um, Tom, uh, we've got six minutes left. Let me uh, push one other issue. We've been using as a trade weapon embargoes. How do you think those play? Um, great question. And that's sort of separate from my um, from this free trade issue. Uh, they're long term policies. That's how they work best. And, and it's their trick. They're tricky. Even then, Trudy, um, I think it's an expression. It's a way short of war. Uh, for us to express our foreign policy and use trade. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see if it has an effect on Russia. It seems like there is some effect, although the war isn't in any way uh, ending. Um, I think it makes, I think embargoes probably, and this is my view, probably more beneficial in not punishing, but uniting the side that's using it. Kind of cobbling together your alliance and you're all in this together now. Um, but there's been enough scholarship on embargoes uh, going way back. Much of it, I don't think historians have done it much, much of it by political sciences though, that have said that largely sanctions embargoes don't work all that well, or, or at least they're not gonna get the results you want, it's certainly in the immediate term. It's they're, they're, it may be drawn out. Saddam Hussein, uh, even embargoes or sanctions like that, even including no fly zones, you know, how effective those are. Um, you know, so, so, so that, I guess it relates somewhat to this is that, that this book is that um, using trade as that sort of uh, negative, that, that, that policy tool that punishes oftentimes doesn't work. Uh, protectionism will gain you votes, but it's not going to work. And it's and as we see from China now too, uh, Xi Jinping turned right around on Trump and, and raised tariffs against American products. Uh, and our so soybean producers, farmers who were avid Trump supporters then said, what's going on? Why, why, how, why we're being hit? So, so those kind of sanctions, embargoes, tariff rise, all that stuff, I don't think is in the long term is effective. Kathy, back to you. And... Um, and on a last question, you spoke at the end of your book about uh, after Trump, now we seem to have a more moderate Biden. And of course, you know, he hadn't been in there that long when you wrote your book. But do you have any thoughts going forward to what it's going to be like with our electoral policy and next year? <laughs> 
Yeah, great. I mean, I've thought about this a lot, Kathy. I, um, I don't think you're going to see much uh, change on China. I think that's now become a, uh, you know, an accepted consensus that people have are fed up with China. Um, still, I know that Biden and his administration are internationalists. And they are not, they're going to be careful. And I think they know the lessons of protectionism. Um, and they're not going to make, uh, you know, that kind of slide. They're not going to use it, certainly against our allies. We're not going to have that uh, as well. I think Joe Biden, I mean, he gets a lot of flack for being his age and everything else. But I think you go back to another president who was also getting flack for being old in Ronald Reagan. And obviously different ideologies, too. But Ronald Reagan was dead set against protectionism, too. Um, he knew he, he had lived through the Great Depression. So I think you'll see with Biden, I think this will be tough on the campaign trail. Um, if it's Trump is the is the nominee, then I think there, you know, you, you won't hear as much about a, a Biden, uh, you know, uh, veering that much from Trump, except he'll say we engage our allies. We we're on to China. If it's another candidate, maybe you'll get a more healthy uh, debate over trade and tariffs um, and, and what's happened. Um, and of course, on labor, too. Um, you know, so it'll, it just depends on, I guess, both parties. But I, I think I think what you're seeing now from the Biden administration, sort of it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's the middle class a middle class trade policy, which usually means moderate protectionism, managed protectionism. Yeah. Um, again, as I mentioned too, and very quickly too, that's what I picked up doing this research. It was always there, the protectionism, even in era, the Reagan years, you thought, oh, they're gone. He's a right wing conservative free market. No, he always had that too. <laughs> it was always there. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your taking the time. This is a great recording. I hope a lot of people log in to listen to it. So thank you for taking the time. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. Oh, I appreciate. And thank you all for your comments and happy travels to everybody. Okay, enjoy <laughs> Spain and France. Well, thank you. And again, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. <laughs>